Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to this Peak Prosperity Podcast. I am your host, Chris Martinson, and today is October 25th, 2016. We are just a few weeks away from a presidential election, which is having a few influences on the markets, but but not too much as yet. Now, you live in a world awash with money, or liquidity as the central bankers call it. In fact, there's so much money being printed out of thin air and injected into capital markets that the world now has over $12 trillion worth of bonds that yield a negative rate of interest. I had to say that slowly because it's a very bizarre concept and I've been studying it for a while and I still don't get it. Uh, The markets would never deliver something like that in a million years left to their own devices. And corporate debt, never been higher. And why not? Companies can borrow and buy back their stock and really boost their performance packages of their C-suite. So what are we to make of all this? Is there really a new normal out there? And most importantly, has financial risk finally been banished to outer space uh, as the bulletproof global equity markets seem to be saying, right? Nothing can dent them. Well, today we are extremely fortunate to have back with us one of the world's leading experts on credit, risk, derivatives, and the inner workings of the financial markets. Janet Tavacoli is the president of Tavacoli Structured Finance, a Chicago-based firm providing consulting services to financial institutions and institutional investors, and she's an expert on derivatives and the author of several related books, including the titles Credit Derivatives and Synthetic Structures, and a second book, Collateralized Debt Obligations and Structured Finance, as well as the brand new book, Decisions, Life and Death on Wall Street, which uh, uh, really reveals the, the extent of her career and depth of what she knows. Janet, thank you so much for joining us today. Chris, it's great to be back with you. I think it's been several years and a lot has happened in those intervening years. It has. It was 2014, so we've got uh, just a million things to catch up on. So. Let's start right on the outside. What are your views here of of the global financial markets post-2008? Are they safer or does the possibility of another financial accident loom in the distance? Well, of course, the financial markets are not safer. What we've done is create a huge distortion that has been to the detriment of the average saver and very much to the benefit of um, DC politicians and of bankers. We've seen a money flow in that direction that is unprecedented in the history of the United States. And of course, we've seen our debt um, accumulate to the extent that as um, many of our financiers and politicians keep pointing out, that under the Obama administration, we've accumulated more debt than we did in the previous years of our republic. Um, That's a pretty serious situation. Um, I think on the ground, you are seeing people getting hidden taxes in the form of um, affordable health care, where their premiums have gone up and up, and they've gotten much less medical service um, for their dollar, and people are even afraid to use their insurance or go to the doctor because their deductibles are so high. Um, So we've been lied to in very profound ways And the mainstream media has given us a narrative that is akin to what you might call transfinance, just like we have now transgenders, right? I'm sorry, you can stick Bruce Jenner on the cover of a magazine and give him fake um, apparatus, but, you know, down below he's still a guy and he's not a young chanteuse. But this is what we're asked to believe, not only in the public narrative, but also in finance. Now, this is interesting, this idea that, that finance uh, has really captivated our, our society as, as much as the cult worship of, of, uh, of, of a celebrity, right? Uh, so 
I love how you've tied this together. Now, now this is something, you know, I, I go and I talk with people at big wealth conferences. I'm sure you do. And these are captains of industry and people really look up to them. And the people are managing billions, sometimes even trillions of dollars. But in many cases, these people who are engaged in finance, they don't produce anything, really. Well, um, I think that's right. What they, what they do do at their best is they facilitate the money flow to make the capital markets work, trading bonds, providing a market, making a market. And if you look at how much money can you make making a market in an honest market, it's nowhere near the percent of GDP that financial services have, has grown to in the past few years. I mean, in an honest market, what can you really take out of a deal or a trade? It should be on the order of 2%, right, of honest transactions. But what we've flooded the market with is a lot of speculation and a lot of um, uh, fake finance so that people are taking enormous sums out of the market in extraordinary dividends, in um, you know IPOs at inflated share prices, and so on. Um, but um, it's only as good as the bid in the marketplace. And so people are worried, people that I know who have money, who have savings, um, they're, they're extremely worried because um, in the past, even if you look at the investment advisor's exam, the investment advisor's exam is almost not even relevant anymore because they would have told you to put money for wi widows and orphans into bonds to you know, get a safe income stream. Today you can't do that. So you forced people into riskier markets. And in some cases, you know, people have gotten the idea that a bubble will always expand and haven't been very careful about the kinds of stocks that they're investing in. So you know, again, I keep cautioning people, make sure there are real assets underneath it and that there are real products that are being bought and sold so that they at least have a chance of an ongoing revenue stream if the market corrects in a big way. Well, fascinating concepts there because uh, much of what's happened in the markets lately that I've seen it has been um, uh, the distortive effects of having this much money thrown into it. And, and of course, it's a party, I, not a party unlike I think in the roaring 20s. Of course, you throw a, a few trillion into a punch bowl, you're going to get a party. But you made an interesting comment back there I'd, I'd love to go further into, which is that my experience, Janet, is that the more experience somebody has, so if I'm talking with a hedge fund manager who's got 20, 30 years under his or her belt, the more scared they are, the more nervous. These are people who actively are uh, in what I would call um, close to panic defense mode. <laughs> They're very, very worried because they have a sense that the market structure itself is broken in some fundamental way or they can't trust it. Uh, and, and that they that it's really shifted. And so on the one hand, I hear people saying, well, yes, we've got this market structure that has all these high frequency trading algorithms. And of course, we got rid of all the gold and blue jackets on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. It's a bunch of blinking server lights. This is a good thing. Uh, these computers are fine. And on the other side, you have people with decades of experience saying, no, it's not fine. This is a little weird. And and they're worried because they, they feel that when this party ends, it's going to end pretty badly, but they can't really predict how or why. Just that's the sense I get from them. Well, that, that's the thing. Nobody can time the market. And as, you know, some very uh, smart people like Jeremy Grantham have said, you know, it's great to be in the middle of a bubble, but it's also very worrying, right? <laughs> Everyone wants to participate in a fake bubble, but it is very worrying. When do you get out? And, uh, you know, what we've been asked to believe and is – to change our perception of reality. We've been asked to believe that the fundamentals of finance have changed, and they haven't, any more than the fundamentals of being able to trust other human beings has changed. But this is um, one of the reasons that I've tied this into social issues, and as you may have seen, I've become a little bit more political in my public views, is that um, what I've seen in finance is something that we're seeing in society, and it's what we know as ideological subversion. Um, I, I would encourage all of your um, fans to look up a YouTube video that features Yuri Bezmenov. Bezmenov was a Soviet spy who came to the United States, and one of his jobs was ideological subversion. 
And so there's a short YouTube video, but I'll cut to the chase because here's what he talks about, what his mission was and what the KGB mission was. And that was, and I'm quoting him now, to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interest of defending themselves, their families, their community, and their country. And he was shocked at how quickly ideological subversion worked in the United States, how idiots just embraced this so that up is down, boys are girls, that kind of BS that confuses people um, other than the resolute truth seekers. And I think you fall into the category of resolute truth seeker. We don't have all the answers, certainly can't do things like time the market, but you still know that up is up and down is down. Well, thank you for that. I, I, I try to, but I'll tell you this. I don't always know what the truth is, but I can always spot bullshit. Well, that, that's right. And you don't always know what the truth is because MSM is lying to you in such profound ways. Mainstream media is lying to you in such profound ways, as are our public officials in many cases. Oh, absolutely. And it's done in ways um, both overt and covert. I was reading front page Wall Street Journal yesterday, and they, they were actually talking about uh, the fact that uh, this uh, Democratic governor funneled a whole bunch of money to the wife of one of the FBI agents who was investigating Hillary uh, for the for the uh, confidential email uh, server uh, scandal. And, and, and they had no alternative opinion on this front page article. All they had were a couple of experts who said, well, it's not clear that any laws were broken, right? <laughs> they could have easily found somebody else who said, I think that looks pretty fishy, you know, but they didn't. And, uh, and I'm, I'm going to quote here now from the first chapter of a book by Edward Bernays back in 1928. Chapter one, first paragraph says, the conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, which is the true ruling power of our country. This is 1928. Janet, what are the chances that, that people who have studied and made a science of, of manipulating and organizing the thoughts of people have gotten better at it since 1928? Well, they've gotten more power since 1928. And you know, I will see you and go back even further um, I uh, recently annotated a couple of books that are in the public domain, so your fans don't have to buy my version of it. I only did that to make it more convenient for people. They can actually go to archive.org and download the PDF if they're happy to read it that way. Um, 20 Years of Inside Life in Wall Street, which talks about speculation. And, you know, he, 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 it's a very lighthearted thing. At the time that he wrote this book, um, insider trading was actually legal. It was not illegal at that time. But he talks about, you know, how in the end speculators, you know, committed suicide, the, the ma market manipulations that went on, and a little bit of government manipulation as well. Um, so it, it goes through the principles of finance. It's a much better book than... Um, Reminiscences of a Stock Operator, in my opinion. It's the best uh, and most entertaining finance book I've ever read. So for people who aren't that familiar with finance, it's a way to get familiar. And it's free, um, unless you buy my version, which isn't free because I had to Kindleize it and uh, put it in a print edition. Um, but there's another um, author, Henry Clues, who wrote a book called 50 Years Inside Wall Street. And the one that I annotated is um, The Wall Street Point of View. Now, Henry Clues... Um, was somebody who saw communists in his time try the same kind of ar uh, ideological subversion that we're seeing right now in the United States. And they failed at that time because there were a lot of people to push back. But he also saw people try to crash the markets when Grant was running against Horace Greeley. And he formed a group of 70 men that he got together to oppose Tammany Hall. Tammany Hall controlled New York. They, they were very corrupt. They had a lock on it. They paid off, um, you know, hired sons, daughters, relatives of other politicians. Um, they were getting the votes. And Henry Clues was a financier. He was born in Britain. And he, he observed these people and he said, you know, none of these people really like each other. They're not bound together by blood. 
They're not bound together by friendship, true friendship, or even um, a common ideology. All these people care about is making money and paying off their friends and power. That was all. Other than that, none of these people had each other's backs. And he said, we can defeat them. And so his group of 70 overthrew the tweed ring. One by one, they knocked the pillars out from under these guys. It took a while, but they did it. And it was just people who were fed up with the corruption. He did it in his time. It can be done. It's not easy. But, you know, people who really have an idea of what the country should look like can defeat people who have inveigled themselves into the system and corrupted it. Now, we see the same thing in finance. I have a group of friends who are appalled at what has happened in the financial system, but their voices have been pretty well silenced. You know, they didn't use garates or daggers to the throat or shoot them in the chest, at least not in most cases, but they have silenced them by um, squelching them from the public view, at least for now. Um, so I, I do encourage people to read the histories of finance and to see that nothing has really changed, uh, but things can change. And this isn't the first time we've had to fight this battle. It's an ongoing push-pull of people who want to grab power and money, who have no substance underneath them. If they didn't have their political jobs, as Peggy Noonan said, um, one woman who's running for a high office would be watching reruns of Bravo. She wouldn't have, you know, friends lined up around her door seeking out her company even. So I, I think, you know, the truth seekers and the people who um, fight against um, corrupt people trying to change your perception of reality will, you know, stay the course and come out better than people who don't. Um, it, it's a precarious time for sure. What we've done is unprecedented in the history of the United States where we have, first of all, um, gotten rid of the benchmark, the gold standard. We don't have any benchmark. We don't have any um, stable benchmark. Instead, we have um, currencies that are being benchmarked off, off each other. So that's not a good place to be. I mean, it's kind of like if you're gaining weight. You want a scale, right? And you want sort of your ideal weight. You don't want to be comparing yourself with a bunch of obese guys in the gym. Um, you do need a benchmark. And we've, so when, once you get rid of the benchmark, then the idea of, you know, there is no standard. You can eat whatever you want and exercise as little as you choose. That's okay. Well, it's not okay. We all know that. Um, and that's what we've actually done in finance. Where we're printing money like mad. We've created a huge distortion where, for years, savers have gotten negative real interest rates, negative real interest rates in the United States for a long, long period of time. And in Europe, we now have sovereigns, of course, who are paying negative um, uh, nominal and negative real interest rates. So it's not just negative real rates, it's negative nominal rates. And um, this is unprecedented in the history of finance. I talked to a retired head of the Chicago Fed, um, so I've probably narrowed the field because I don't know how many of them are still living, and he said, none of us knows what's going on. We've never done anything like this before, and that was as a result of my basically you know, painting him into a corner in our conversation because this is something no one's seen before. They don't know what the end game is. They are totally at sea, and it's their own fault because they got rid of their scale. They got rid of their own benchmarks, and they tried to say that, you know, we can muddle through without having any way of measuring what we're doing. Or, or driving by looking in the rearview mirror. Uh, or her, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. it's, it is insane. So, but I, I love the way you started this, which is that uh, there's nothing new under the sun. So if you really want to understand what's happening today, you would be well served to just study what happened before because we've been through this before, and it's and it, it is that push pull uh, where I think the seesaw gets a little overloaded at one point. We clearly have people driving who are um, I think they're dangerous because they don't even recognize the degree to which they are actually radical and radicalized in their views. They think they're the center normal, and I think that's largely what this political debate is about at least on one level that's happening in the US but it's happening in Europe it's happening other places in the world which is that 
when when power gets over concentrated like this, especially financially, it does a lot to disenfranchise a lot of people. And, and you mentioned suffering under negative real interest rates for a while. And, and they're only as negative as we say they are because we believe our inflation statistics, which I think are off by at least 200 basis points, but somewhere in that zone. And so it, it's it's just getting harder and harder and harder. And for uh, certain elements of the political apparatus to just ignore that and minimize that and say, we're going to just preserve the status quo because it's the best thing we got going. But it's not. It's not the best thing going for most people. They're trying to normalize the abnormal. And, you know, you see it in finance. You see it in our society where they're trying to tell you that abnormal is normal, where both Bush and Obama, as an, another example, said Islam means peace. That's what Obama said. Um, I'm here to tell you that's a lie. It does not mean peace. Islam means submission. Now, I say this as a, an American woman of northern European extraction. My last name is Iranian. It's Iranian because my ex-husband was Iranian, and I lived in Iran during the Islamic Revolution. I lived in Iran at a time when women wore Western clothing, did their hair, wore makeup, went out, had fun, um, had, were in every level of society. And then the Islamic Revolution came where Khomeini lied to his female supporters and told them that nothing would change for them. Everything changed. Women took to the streets in March of 2009 to protest the new rule that said that they all had to wear the hijab. These women were violently suppressed. There is nothing about Islam that is going to be healthy for the American society if fundamentalists are allowed to take over our government. And um, when we have fundamentalists coming into the country who have these views that, to me, are extremely anti-female, one of the other things they did in Iran is they rolled the marriage age back from you know, 18, 16 with parental consent under the Shah, to nine years old because Sharia law allows it because Muhammad married a six-year-old and consummated the marriage when the child was nine. So um, that is their perfect man, and Sharia law allows marriage at the age of nine. Now, since then, Iran has become enlightened and raised that marriage age to 13. You can adopt a child and marry her as her stepfather when she's 13. That's legal in Iran. Um, or at least they tried to make it legal. I don't know if they succeeded in doing that, but they did roll the marriage age back to 13. And of course, a girl can marry a 13 with parental consent. So you can, you know, trade her to an uncle. Um, you know, it, it's that kind of thing that we're not hearing about daily in the public domain. Instead, you hear Islam means peace. Well, I'm sorry. You know, this is not a, a fringe view in Islam. This is a view, a fundamentalist view, shared, according to Pew Research, by tens of millions of um, fundamentalists. And of those tens of millions, hundreds of thousands are jihadis who will actively engage in violence. Um, I recently um, wrote an article for the Gatestone Institute, which is about to be published. It hasn't been published yet, talking about this subject. And the reason I've become more vocal is because I see this common thread of our leaders, and they work for us, by the way, so they're abusing their bosses, of our leaders trying to change our perception of reality, even though there is an abundance of information, just like Yuri Besmanov warned, you know, as much as he might have been a scumbag in his past, he was speaking the truth here. Despite an abundance of information, they're trying to confuse and distort the Americans' perception of reality so that you can't think straight. And so I think it behooves people who do have information to be more public and more vocal about it, despite that other people won't like it. I agree. And, and uh, let, let me expand a little bit what, what you're saying, because I'm actually a, an equal opportunity kind of guy. And I believe that fundamentalists and extremists of all stripes are not people I actively want to be hanging out with or trying to form a society with. And this comes from all, all religious angles for me. But there's a, a, a strong current of, of this idea for me, which is that um, ideology is important, but another thing that really matters here in this story for me, Janet, is that when you take away, when people have no hope anymore, they become radicalized, they become extremist, and 
Um, I think that the path we're on, where the world is not recognizing that this printing our way to prosperity thing is enriching a tiny, tiny slice at the expense of everybody else, with the Federal Reserve failing to recognize that their policies are distributive, not prosperity making, but redistributive. It's the ultimate in social welfare, but, but happening at sort of a corporate elite level. So as they siphon the oxygen away from whole swaths of the population, they're leaving people without hope. I think that ends badly. I think that's third worldization. I think that you, know, you, you find yourself in a situation where you go far enough, you end up with Venezuela. But, but yes, there are um, discrete efforts to just, not just shape public opinion right now, but to badly mislead people. And I'm, I'm thinking yeah. particularly right now about the demonization of Putin. A lot of people are like, oh my God, Putin, you know, they're Chris, you know, he's just hacked the servers. I'm like, well, first of all, no evidence has been presented. Shame on you. Oh, because no, 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 just a second. Hang on, Chris, because North Korean hackers and Chinese hackers and U.S. hackers and Romanian hackers, they're so last year. You have to get on board with the latest distortion of reality. <laughs> <laughs> Right. But I'm tracking this as one of these truth seekers. I'm saying, no, no, no. The demonization of Putin began even before the Ukrainian quote, air quotes here revolution, which was a Western backed and inspired sort of a movement. Right. Um, this annexation of Crimea, which is his cardinal sin, was probably the most democratic thing that's happened this century, where 95 plus percent of the people in Crimea voted to go a direction. We can disagree that whether they made a good vote or not, but they voted, right? So I've been watching this demonization of Putin all the way along, and, and the same thing happened with the MH17 Malaysian airline shootdown over Ukraine, where again, full demonization of Russia, but, but no evidence was presented from the US intelligence apparatus, which would have included satellite photos, telemetry readings, and other hard evidence to say, this is where the missile came from. That data is still missing, even from the most recent uh, Dutch report that came out. And that makes me very suspicious overall. So when you stack all of that together and then they say, oh, it was Putin that hacked the DNC servers, trust us, no data. Uh, I, I see the pattern here. And this is one of the patterns that concerns me a lot of late because I'm very worried that it's one thing to rush into war and demonize, I don't know, um, uh, you know, the Panamanian president at the time or whatever happened in Grenada, or maybe even further we go into take out Saddam Hussein in, in Iraq. but. Uh, it's quite another to be doing this against somebody like Putin and Russia at this juncture. And I'm very worried. I'm very worried because I don't... You mean somebody who has nuclear weapons? Yes. Uh, well, in, you in know, I, I don't want to argue the merits or, or, or uh, faults of Putin, but I will say this. It is very similar to Project Fear. I call it Project Fear 2.0. They're trying to create a boogeyman of Russia. Suddenly, hey, whoever heard of Chinese or North Korean hackers... It's only Russian hackers, right? And they're trying to somehow link Donald Trump to that as if it's some sort of conspiracy between Donald Trump and Putin or that Donald Trump can, you know, uh, signal him in speeches so that Putin does his bidding, whatever. And, and then they try to turn that around and say Trump is Putin's puppet or Putin is Trump puppet, you know, can't keep it straight because it's all BS. Um, but it's Project Fear. And it's trying to tell the public there is no alternative. If you vote for this other party, then it's going to lead to you know, um, a marriage with Putin and it's going to undermine our society. But the reality is it's the other way around. We now know, and, and this happened in my district, by the way. I live in um, Illinois, in the 7th Congressional District. And um, prior to a, prompt, a, a Trump rally in my district, you may have read, the rally was canceled, and it was canceled because of riots. Well, it turns out that those riots were the result of Hillary Clinton's campaign hiring thugs to cause violence at a Trump rally, which they first tried to blame on Trump, and when that didn't seem to be working, they blamed it on Bernie Sanders. Mm. And again, this is um, Hillary Clinton's playbook. She wrote her thesis on Saul Alinsky, who wrote a book called Rules for Radicals on how to undermine um, a society. Um, so she's very friendly with that. Now, Obama was on a board of um, an institution with Bill Ayers. And you remember uh, Bill Ayers was with the weathermen who engaged in bombings on terrorism on US soil. And Obama, when he was on that board with um, Alinsky, um, he was, uh, he, he was um, on a Chicago not-for-profit 
and he served as a paid director. And uh, they provided startup capital for something called the Midwest Academy. Now, the Midwest Academy was an activist organization described as, and this, wait for it, teaching tactics of direct action, confrontation, and intimidation. <laughs> Now, guess who else um, uh, was one of the board members of the Midwest Academy? And let me just uh, look this up to make sure I'm not um, giving you incorrect information. I, I believe it was the fellow um, Robert Creamer, who is the guy who is linked to, um, uh, who, who was caught on the Project Veritas video. And as you know, Creamer was at the White House more than 300 times and 42 or 45 visits directly with Obama. At least that's what was on the, the visitor's log. Now, now Josh Ernest, the, the spokesman, said that Obama doesn't have any recollection meeting with this guy. So I guess you have to meet with somebody probably 50 times before you remember them, I think. Uh, Creamer's, a, <laughs> Creamer's a Chicago guy. He is uh -huh. the husband of um, an Illinois representative. They know each other. This is not... You know, he wants to deny that he met with the guy, um, but you see these links for um, this kind of activity, and now we know that um, Kramer was involved in hiring thugs to disrupt Trump conventions, and yet they're trying to say that um, Trump supporters are violent, Trump is, you know, Hitler, way overused term if you actually know what Hitler did. Um, you know, it's a false analogy. And yet, who is using those tactics? It's been the D Democratic Party. So, you know, talk about ideological subversion. They're the ones who are doing it, and they're trying to, you know, blame it on everybody but them. And I think what Hillary Clinton's campaign has done is illegal, and now um, it has tentacles all the way to the White House. This is worse than Watergate. And yet, mainstream media is not reporting on it. And <laughs> And I think that's why people are fed up and disgusted with um, organizations like MSNBC and CNN and, and so on. I mean, Rachel Maddow at MSNBC tried to say these were Trump supporters who created the violence here in Chicago. And I do um, resent this very deeply because I had two friends who were frightened to death in that riot. They had, um, I did not go to that rally, but they wanted to go to that rally. And as they were exiting, um, they felt physically threatened. And uh, they blocked traffic here in, uh, on a major artery. This is all in my neighborhood. Um, so I look at that and I say, okay, Hillary Clinton, you hired people who actually injured people in that crowd and injured policemen. Um, this is criminal. Well, if only there were a law against inciting a riot. Uh... <laughs> there is. But um, the, now the problem that we have, and this is what I saw in Iran, there weren't three branches of government. Even under the Shah, there were not three branches of government because the judiciary was co-opted by the, by the Shah. Um, but one of the things I love about the United States is our um, constitution, which calls for three branches of government. But today, it seems as if our three branches of government are conjoined triplets because um, the DOJ seems to be corrupted. Um, you just have to look at the FBI investigation into Hillary's server where she corrupted national security and has not been held accountable for it. Um, then you, you look at our um, Supreme Court where um, the Obama administration was crowing about um, intimidating Justice John Roberts about, over Obamacare. Um, th this is an appalling situation, and we are the people that these people work for, and they act as if they are our overlords. It's, it's insulting in so many ways. Well, it is. And, you know, sometimes these things tend to elevate a little more sharply during a, a campaign cycle, and then they, they drift back down again. But here's why I want to have this conversation with you, because you are paying attention to this, and, and it matters. And, and, and here's why it matters. Maybe this anecdote helps. Um, a couple of years ago, I was in Charleston, South Carolina, giving a talk, and I got picked up by an Uber driver, nice 60-year-old guy. Uh, turns out I'm chatty guy, so I'm talking with him. He's from Sudan. And so, you know, I asked him, he was just all so grateful, like, I can't, this America's great, it's wonderful, I really love it here, and I kept digging, I was like, you know, but, you know, tell me, tell me, do you have any concerns at all? And finally, he let his guard down, he said, yeah, I'm, I'm scared. I came here 20 years ago, I left as a doctor from Sudan, 
Uh, I left under political asylum, and I left for the same reasons that I'm seeing happening here now. He said it's early, but I'm watching the same things happen. And it was basically that breakdown of the rule of law where it suddenly becomes revealed to the common person that there's a set of laws that are harsh and draconian that apply to them, and another set that don't seem to apply at all to, to the, the other class, and they become more and more brazen. So he was really worried about the rule of law and also the, uh, the degree to which this begins to polarize the country into uh, separate camps and, and ideologies and whatnot. So that, that's a very serious thing, and we should be talking about it. And you're right, the mainstream media is actively colluding, or I'll use this word, conspiring, to hold back what I think is probably uh, far more explosive information than Watergate in its scope, in its breadth, uh, and, and, and overall what it says. And if we don't expunge that, if we don't expose that, if we, it's just like a hairball, we won't be able to swallow it. It'll be stuck in the nation's throat for a long well, time. Well, well, Chris, just to keep everyone's bearings, um, I, I, I think you should absolutely reject anyone trying to label you as, an, as a radical because you point out that things are being done that violate our constitution. And the rights that were co that were um, explained in the Constitution. The Constitution didn't give us rights. The Constitution simply recorded our rights. And I, I think that um, today, when you bring up that people are violating the Constitution, you're labeled a radical. They're trying to turn it, the tables around. Well, don't accept that. Um, one thing, um, one of the reasons I wrote Decisions: um, Life and Death on Wall Street. It's a brief memoir about my time on Wall Street, and it was partially spurred by the suicide of my former boss who worked at Merrill Lynch. And um, we, we took different paths in our careers, and um, he wasn't the only suicide that I talk about in this book. But the common theme there was that people who did understand the fundamentals of principles of finance either went along with things that they should not have gone along with in some cases, or when they were asked to, give, uh, to go along with things that they knew were incorrect, the pressure was so unbearable that they opted out in the most final way possible. And that kind of pressure, that kind of confusion, can at first um, cause you to take the wrong path because it, you know, you've got everyone around you shouting the wrong thing. You're extremely well rewarded for doing the wrong thing. And there are no um, punishments. Um, but in the end, they get caught out too. Either they get caught out because they realize it's going to be a big scandal and they see everything they identified. And, and the other danger is just your whole personality being identified with your business card is a very dangerous place to be when you're in an environment like that. Because if you um, think that that is the most important thing about you, when it crumbles underneath you, you might opt out with suicide. You just don't see the path of your life ahead of you. But if you have done the wrong thing, in the case of uh, my former boss, he realized that he was um, going to be dragged into Senate investigations, uh, possibly dragged into court. And since he was edged out of Deutsche Bank, he would be the fall guy. And he was a very senior guy at Deutsche Bank, um, Anshu Jain, whom I also knew from Merrill Lynch days, and his, his co-CEO had put Bill Brooksbitt's name forward to be the chief risk officer at Deutsche Bank, and the Bundesaufsichtsamt für Kreditwesen um, rejected that. Um, they, for a, a lot of reasons that I explain in the book. And um, a month after being forced out of Deutsche Bank, Brookschmidt committed suicide, and Deutsche tried to say it had nothing to do with his job. The other common pattern here is when these men have committed suicide, then management has quickly clo clo closed ranks and said it had nothing to do with their job. Um, here's something that's kind of an incredible fact. I met Josef Ackerman, the former CEO of Deutsche Bank, in um, Israel at a, an Israeli business conference in Tel Aviv. And um, he was very pleasant, very charming, and all that. But um, I knew quite a bit of his history. He had been the CEO of Deutsche Bank when a lot of the problematic trades were put on. Then he was edged out of Deutsche Bank and became the head of Zurich Insurance. And one of the suicides I talk about is the CFO at Zurich Insurance who worked under him. So these are now two guys who worked under him 
who were pressured to cook numbers and in some cases went in one case went along more willingly than the other and um Joseph Ackerman um when Pierre Valtier his uh, CFO committed suicide um he his wife said it was because of the pressure he was under at work this wasn't ambiguous at all and uh, Zurich uh, Insurance tried to say it had nothing to do with his job. He had other problems. Whatever, it had nothing to do with what he was being asked to do at work. And um, Josef Ackerman um, took responsibility because the finger was pointed at him due to um, a note that Baltier left. And uh, his wife, Fabian, came to the shareholders' meeting to confront management because they were basically trying to say, oh, he's crazy, you know, nothing to see here. And she wasn't having it. She had his back, and she said, I just thought that his, you know, the love of his family and the love that he had for his family would carry him through, and I overestimated the strength that that would give him. Um, but uh, she was not having it, that it had nothing to do with his job. So um, Joseph Ackerman resigned, and if you look at it, he's part of the Bilderberg group and all that. If you look at his Wikipedia profile, you see none of this on his Wikipedia profile. That's how good these people are at scrubbing bad news from the past. Well, there's a, a larger thing there for everybody listening, which is that if you over-identify with your job, if you become the person on the business card, uh, you really have nothing to fall back on. It, it becomes, you, your identity is external. And uh, I think that the, the, the crisis that we're going to face, because the, I don't believe you can print your way to prosperity, and I don't think you can shoot uh, risk to the outer space never to see it again. Um, so, so when we have this crisis, it's going to be pretty hard for people. It's why, you know, one of the things we counsel at Peak Prosperity is that emotional resilience is perhaps the most important form of resilience you can garner. It's good to have a nice bank account and, and some material assets and other things. But gosh, if you can't handle the crisis when it comes, none of that will matter. Um, so so I'm, I'm wondering, because I've got you here, and, uh, and this has been a hot topic for a lot of people, is uh, Deutsche Bank, since you mentioned the term. Uh, what has been going on with Deutsche Bank? And, and it's out of the news right at the moment, or it was all in the news about a month ago. But I'm wondering in particular, there was a set of transactions that caught my eye. It was January, maybe February 2016, where I noted that um, a bunch of credit default swaps, almost a trillion or maybe a little more than a trillion, got offloaded and quietly picked up by Citi, JPM, Goldman, I think, were the trio. Uh, did you notice that transaction, and, and, and is it normal for a, a big, uh, soon-to-be struggling financial institution to, to, to you know, ship a, a, a trillion in, in derivatives uh, across the pond, or, or uh, what, what's really going on with Deutsche Bank, too, more generally? Well, um, you know, when I wrote Decisions, um, I, I wrote it in 2014, and um, people who read it shorted Deutsche, um, because I was pretty clear that there were... Um, huge problems and it had a weak balance sheet even though at that time they were lying about it. Um, oh, here, here's another interesting anecdote that is not in decisions and it, it, it pertains to Bill Brookschmidt and that is that um, afterwards when it was finally reported, I tried to stick to things that were in the public domain and not private things um, because you need references for the things that I was saying which are very extraordinary. Um, I needed to back up everything that I said with things that are in the public domain, although people don't normally find them. Um, but that said, um, the, the month before um, he committed suicide, Bill had been pressured to give a presentation to the board about stress tests that painted a rosier picture of the bank's situation than Bill wanted to project. So what you keep hearing about Deutsche is um, level three assets. Level three assets are assets that are not easily marked to mark and have very subjective valuations, so that there may be issues with level three assets. Well, I'm here to tell you it's not just the level three assets. It's also the level one and the level two assets. The level two assets are marked to market, marked to model assets, uh, rather marked to model assets, and just as a shorthand to, of a way to think about it, the level one are marked to market. And I talk about this in more detail for people who are interested in like risk professionals at banks and their managers in a book called Risk that I put out this year, Risk, Your Global Guide. Um, and it's a short book, right? But um, people keep asking me, how is it you know that these banks are in trouble? How did you know that Merrill was in trouble? 
Um, I even quote the treasurer of the DNC about Merrill. He had asked me in 2007, where will Merrill be in six months? Now, I, I don't give direct investment advice to people, but what I said to him, which is what I could say in an email, I said, I can tell you this, Andy, um, it will, Andy, Andrew Tobias, it will not be in my portfolio and it will not be in Warren Buffett's portfolio. And at that time, Merrill was lying about their accounting and saying everything was fine. Um, you know, none of those people were held accountable for those lies. But um, I explain how I look at risk, how I look at derivatives, and how I know that things are in trouble and how much better you can do in a portfolio simply by doing one thing, scrubbing the fraud out. And you will outperform most portfolios just for that one act because um, it, it, by far fraud has been the biggest problem in uh, destro value destruction. And when you create money out of thin air with no benchmark, and you don't have the productivity behind it, um, that's fraud. I'm sorry, what the Fed is doing is a form of fraud. Um, and they are not doing the public a service and not getting their hands around the scope of what our current problems are. So um, that's a long way of answering your question that it's not just about Deutsche, although Deutsche is a huge big symptom of it because Europe has not recapitalized their banks. But I don't just talk about Deutsche. I mean, we have other large banks in Europe that also have similar problems. And one of the hilarious things that I, I just can't believe financial reporters don't talk about more is um, the Fed in New York has cited banks like Deutsche, like Banco Santander, and more for not even having their paperwork in order. It would be as if you didn't balance your checkbook and you're trying to tell your wife that everything's fine and you're just writing checks without having any idea whether you can cover it. Um, but in their New York offices, they haven't even tracked their trades. Well, I'm here to tell you, you can't actually manage the risk of an institution when your basic paperwork is in such a disarray and disorder. Um, in one instance, um, one large bank was uh, recording the buys and sells of swaps the wrong way, and they didn't catch it for a couple of years. How can you be so demented that you, your um, operations are in such disarray? And this is now, don't forget, years and years after the financial crisis when they told us that they were investing in risk management and that they had their systems in order. Um, another example is the London whale trade. That trade happened years after the financial crisis. And what you found is that J.P. Morgan was the poster child for bad risk management in that area. That was a unit that reported directly to Jamie Dimon. And they were using crappy Excel models with no um, document control. Um, they had a risk manager in who wasn't qualified and who was um, uh, the brother-in-law or something. There was nepotism involved in his appointment. Um, I, I go into that in, in risk in more detail. And um, they uh, put on a huge position um, that busted their VAR limits. I mean, it goes on and on. I mean, there were several red flags for bad risk management years after the financial crisis. And they destroyed in that one unit, in that silo, if you looked at it, years of profits. So, you know, the previous years were really fake profits because they weren't risk adjusted. And you have these persistent problems on and on and on in our banks. And so when I look at the balance sheets, I look at the large positions that people are telling you are just hunky-dory. I start there. Because when you start there, if you find a problem, it's game over. And um, that was like the um, AAA rated CDOs that were really junk rated, which is you know my sweet spot, obviously, because I wrote collateralized debt obligations and structured finance. The other interesting thing is if you look on Amazon at the reviews of the first book in 2003, Collateralized Debt Obligations and Structured Finance, you see little jerks who wrote things like, oh, she's paranoid, she's blah, blah, blah. Um, there was one guy in Europe who um, wrote a bunch of phony reviews on Amazon that were revealed because Amazon had a glitch. And so I discovered his identity. And when I met him in public, butter wouldn't melt in the guy's mouth. I just wanted to sock him. He never knew that I knew this. Um, he, he, he runs a bank in Europe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, that's how much people are willing to lie. When people tell the truth and put information in the public domain, their first mission is to try to discredit them. 
and it's very different than um, when I worked as a chemical engineer. There, if you found a problem, like a valve was undersized or there was another issue, people were grateful because you identified what doesn't work and basically you're helping. Um, in finance, when you identify what doesn't work, people want to kill you because they know that they can cover it up for several bonus cycles. But if you bring it to the fore, that's going to destroy their, their narrative that they're making a lot of money risk-free. And so then they want to kill you. Now, I don't know how you bust the fraud out because I, I look at, say, a bank balance sheet and I see what they've recorded as tier one, tier two, tier three assets. And as you say, they're, they're, they're marked to market, marked to model, and marked to fantasy. I don't know how to tease that apart. Um, I just assume that anything that gets marked to model and then especially marked to fantasy, that there's fibbing involved. So I just automatically conclude they're all full of lies. But I, I don't have any more sophistication than that to be able to really dig under and know exactly what I'm looking at. So I did. I dug into Deutsche Bank's, you know, financial statements to say, can I detect what's going on here? And it's such a morass of of craziness, you know, that like one paragraph footnote on page 200 of the annual report sort of says, yeah, and we're doing some stuff with derivatives, but trust us, we got it. Like, I don't even know how to begin with that except to say I, there's no way to analyze this properly. Well, uh, they don't know where to begin with it either because now you've got people, I, I call it math salad when you look at the models because you have people in different areas doing their own thing. And so when you do a stress test, some of them are internally inconsistent. They don't know what they're doing either. Um, so um, don't feel bad or put more time and effort into it in that way. Um, now the question is, how do you fix it? And um, that's the theme of risk and the theme of decisions, life and death on Wall Street. And that is, um, you know, the, the whole um, point of life and death on Wall Street was to persuade you that the only way to, to fix this is really to break up the banks, again, into depository institutions and into the speculative risk institutions where partnership capital is at risk and not taxpayer money. And you absolutely have to divorce taxpayer money from funding that activity. It should not be allowed. Um, it never should have been allowed that Goldman became a bank holding company when ba Goldman had um, a hand in creating the financial crisis. And, um, you know, there's one conspiracy theory that um, that part of the financial crisis was a regime change in the United States. Well, I don't know about that, but I do know, if you look back at Henry Clouse's, um work, that um, when Horace Greeley was running against Grant, um, that Tammany Hall did try to manufacture a financial crisis in order to get Greeley elected. But that was thwarted by Clues and his group, and they took the evidence to President Grant at the time, who was um, the incumbent. Um, so they actually did plot to create a financial crisis to frighten people into voting for Greeley. Um, so it's not unprecedented in the United States. I just haven't looked at that angle of the financial crisis to see whether or not I agree with people who have speculated about that. I, I don't know. Um, but I, here's what I do know, is that one of the most profound lies of the financial crisis was that, go, that Goldman did not need a government bailout, because it did. And yet these people have um, punked us by, even after we bailed them out, claiming they're the best and the brightest, and Congress put no restrictions on the bailouts of any meaning. And that money flowed back to Congress so that now Congress is richer than ever. Their families are richer than ever because you know, their extended family is hired in, um, in direct and indirect ways by the financial industry. And we have a bought Congress that is more bought than it ever has been in the past. Good luck trying to get term limits on those, that nice bunch of kids. Yeah, that's that. That there's plenty to be angry about, but I, you know, I loved uh, uh, the amount of peak that I got into my life when I really understood what happened with the AIG bailouts, uh, where AIG had had underwritten a bunch of credit default swaps that went belly up, and of course they were totally undercapitalized in the division involved, and they needed that 186 billion dollar bailout, of which 13 billion went straight to Goldman Sachs for a hundred cents on the dollar. Well, I, I can tell you um, a little story about that. Um, you, may, uh, you may not know this, but I wrote about it in Dear Mr. Buffett, um, and I, I also mention it in Decisions, I believe, and I may mention it in Risk. Um, in August of 2007, the Wall Street Journal quoted me 
um, saying that AIG had mismarked its books. And they didn't just mismark. This is August of 2007, more than a year before that bailout. And um, I told uh, Dave Riley at the Wall Street Journal that it was material. And the way this came about is um, Riley called me up, I believe, that day and said, hey, do you have a story for me? And I said, boy, I have a hell of a story for you. AIG mismarked its books. And you may recall that you know AIG had just gone through this lawsuit with, uh, Ace, uh, with Hank Greenberg um, about – another accounting issue and and I said here we go again this is you know material well the Wall Street Journal didn't report the word material and they initially um, were nervous about reporting what I said because they called AIG and AIG denied it and uh, Riley came back to me and said are you sure and I said yes I'm positive there's just no doubt about it and I said let's take for an example and I was just looking at as a large position, one that everyone said was okay, and it wasn't. They were um, super seniors, these so-called super AAA tranches of a CDO, but they were. it was collateralized by triple B tranches of other CEOs that were impaired. And of course, it, people weren't admitting they were impaired, but when I rolled up the loan losses, I said they already, they are going to experience principal loss here. And they're saying that um, they, there was zero chance they would experience any loss in that position. And I said, wow, that's a whopper of a lie. And um, they were already getting margin calls, and Goldman, behind the scenes, was um, asking them for much bigger margin and giving them lower markdowns than AIG wanted. I didn't know that at the time. All I knew is that AIG lied about its accounting, and it, they lied about it materially. And um, so AIG said, no, no, um, you know, she doesn't know what she's talking about. And uh, Riley said, are you willing to stand behind this? And I said, absolutely, I am. But when I originally talked to Riley, I had agreed to talk to him on background because here I'm taking on a huge institution, right? And, and I'm basically saying that they committed a crime. They materially mismarked their books. So um, one of the senior editors there, Mike Sikinolfi, called me. Um, he's known me for years, and he said, Janet, we can you know, run with this article, but we feel it's much stronger and much more comfortable if we can actually name you. And I said, all right, Mike, uh, I'm, I stand behind this. Yes, you may name me. Uh, of course, AIG's PR flack called me afterwards and said, um, uh, and I said, I'm willing to talk to your CFO, but I'm not willing to talk to you about it. And if you would like me to walk through this with your CFO, I'm happy to do that. But do not call me up and try to intimidate me to retract what I said, because I'm not going to do that. So um, the CFO never called me, of course. But um, a few months later, they were cited for material issues with their accounting. And material uh, around the exact thing that you'd called them out on? Yes, yes. And it was those uh, tranches, by the way, were, were the ones that ended up in Maiden Lane, the ones that I was looking at. And, um, Which ended up on the, the Fed balance that, sheet. That Goldman made the huge margin call against AIG and Goldman's trading partners made the huge margin call against AIG, which caused the bailout. So they were exactly those. So, you know, for people to say that we didn't know this in advance, when Hank Paulson said we didn't know we had these huge issues in advance, no one knew. Well, that's a lie. People did know. People like me knew. I knew. Um, you know, and there were articles in the public domain. So you can go back and look at those articles and say, um, how is it that the Treasury wasn't better prepared? And I think they timed when they wanted the crisis to occur because it was an ongoing crisis. You know, th th this was horrible, right? I mean, in, in 2007, uh, and, and Andy was happy to go on the record about our email exchange, you know, where I warned him off Merrill. Um, this is you know, for our financiers to claim and get away with claiming that they didn't know that they were lying about their accounting is just ludicrous. Yeah. Gosh, honest, I, I didn't know that giving $600,000 to the wife of an FBI agent investigating one of my principal benefactors was going to have any influence whatsoever. I'm shocked, shocked, <laughs> shocked well, to discover influence was going on here. <laughs> look at John Corzine. John Corzine was the CEO of MF Global that went bankrupt. And uh, John Corzine was one of the chief bundlers for Obama's reelection campaign 
So Corzine was not indicted after um, his trades were the cause of a huge margin call that MF Global could not meet and instead diverted um, <laughs> diverted customer money to meet John Corzine's trades margin call. Yeah, I don't manage money, but Janet, I'm pretty sure that if I commingled client funds, uh, the SEC would have something to say to me uh, in, by by one o'clock this afternoon. It would be very uh, rapid. Chris, commingled is such a, a nice word when theft of customer money is more appropriate. Theft. In fact, Marcy Captor, who was at the time in the House, the head of the banking committee of the House Banking Committee, she's a Democrat from Michigan. She was um, wanted to confront um, Corzine in the congressional investigations, and the New Jersey delegation came to her. Marcy Kaptur told me this when I met with her in D.C. They came to her and told her prior to the congressional hearings, no criminality pertains to John Corzine. And she resisted, and they told her she wasn't being a good Democrat. She read a special order into the congressional record, and she told Corzine in the hearing that most of us would call this theft. So she did go that far, and she was punished for it, where the Democrats didn't support her um, very well in her reelection campaign. Um, she, her district was redistricted. Um, she was running in the primary against Dennis Kucinich, and she used almost all of her funds having to run against Kucinich. She prevailed. And then in the uh, runoff, she on the uh, Republican side, she was running against John the Plumber. And she did win. She did win re-election, but, you know, they took their pound of flesh out of Marcy Kaptur. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now, so here's how I connect these dots, right? So we see that Goldman Sachs, like, you know, paid, played fast and loose, took some risks, should have lost a bundle, but was made completely whole by the Federal Reserve riding in and saying, gosh, it's a, gosh, Goldman, so sorry for your losses. Here's 100 cents back on the dollar for your busted trades. And just last week, there was an article came out in the LA Times about how servicemen and women in California who were given signing bonuses a decade ago to sign up for another tour of duty in Afghanistan and or Iraq, uh, put their lives on the line. They've now determined that maybe they shouldn't have given those bonuses because there was a little bit of fraud going on at the higher levels in the military. And they said, quote, uh, rules are rules. We have to get this money back from these people, right? So for the little people, they're going to come after you and say, you, you know, laws are important. We have to follow the rules. We're going to claw back $20,000 from you, even if you can't afford it. Even after you fulfilled your end of the bargain on the contract, we get to rewrite the contract uh, post facto because we're the government. And then you wander to the other side and you see how the game is played sort of at the, at the Uber bailout level. Uh, and, and it's just maddening. And, and, and this is, is the larger context that I think is beginning to drive the politics in this country. And it's only going to get worse if we don't confront this and begin to level that playing field in some way. Well, I agree with that, and I think that's why you're seeing um, so many people supporting Donald Trump. And uh, I don't know if your viewers are interested in this. Um, I normally don't get that political, but I have this year. Um, I've always been an in, a left-leaning independent, right? Obviously, you know, I just mentioned I have friends at high levels in the Democratic Party. Um, but this year, I am a Trump supporter, and I ran in, on the ticket in my district as an alternate Trump delegate to the RNC. Um, I got the most votes for an alternate delegate, but I didn't win because just a couple of days prior, there was that riot um, before the Trump rally. So um, Kasich carried the day in our district, but I did manage to still save a lot of votes, which matters in Illinois because you need the votes at the state level as well. And by the way, you know, people should not be deterred from voting even if they're living in a state that's a different color because you want the votes for your candidate in the popular election to um, so that people can't de try to delegitimize their election. So definitely vote because the popular vote does matter for that from that aspect. Um, but that said, um, you know, we don't have perfect candidates running, but I like Trump's policies of reform, and I like his trade policy. 
um, I liked his idea of a progressive tariff, which he doesn't talk about much publicly. I think a lot of people's eyes glaze over when you talk about something like this. But we've done this before, and it works. The principles of finance don't change. And uh, under the McKinley administration, um, this is before we had personal income taxes on the books. We had personal income tax during the Civil War, and then we had it in uh, we. Um, passed the 16th Amendment in 1913. But prior to that, we didn't pay personal income taxes. So how did we pay our bills? Well, we did it through tariffs. But revenue tariffs don't work well. Progressive tar uh, uh, protective tariffs, where you tax things that we have the capability of making in the United States, um, will work. Now, at the time when McKinley um, was passing that act, um, the other side was claiming that that won't work, our trading partners will cut us off, project fear, right? Well, they didn't know what they were talking about because it worked like a charm and it worked actually pretty quickly. Businesses came back to the United States, they started manufacturing here, even though our labor costs were higher, and yet our exports increased. People wanted American goods. And um, so you got more, um, uh, more than enough at that time in taxes to cover our bills, and we had an embarrassing surplus is what they, how they call it. They called it literally an embarrassing surplus. But um, in our case, we have so many entitlements that we have a personal income tax as well, right? We can't support ourselves just on, on something like that. And we've sort of not looked at pro, uh, protective tariffs. Well, Trump is proposing protective tariffs and he's also proposing letting people repatriate their money to the United States to invest here. So that combination um, will, again, revitalize you know, the internal demand in our market and um, will also perhaps increase payroll taxes. The other interesting thing is people keep saying Trump doesn't pay taxes. Well, I, I don't know what his recent tax returns look like, but obviously he's paying a hell of a lot in payroll taxes, so you still pay that. And I think um, if you know, you've never run a business, then Hillary Clinton may not be aware that payroll taxes actually are a tax. But, um, you know, that said, I have taken a firm stand on one candidate versus the other because the deep corruption in the Democratic Party that has infiltrated all branches of government, uh, and of course the Republican Party too, they're not um, absolved here in any way. But um, Trump will be a disruptor of that. And you know, I don't know whether he'll use this opportunity to advantage himself the way the others have, but I don't think if he does that it will be in the way the others have. In other words, I don't think that he will trade national security for money, which I think all of us should find deeply offensive because I do believe that the Clinton Foundation should be indicted, just as Rudy Giuliani believes it. And I believe it for the same reasons he does. I, I'm a big believer in rule of law. I, it turns out I am a, a single issue voter this time, and my issue is nuclear war. I, I'd like to avoid it. Um, I, I do not like the, the war stance of of Hillary Clinton. That said, I'm, I'm also not saying who I am voting for because it, it doesn't seem to help me get my broader message out. Now, as we close this up, I, I have to ask this, which is about um, – uh, given everything you know and, and knowing that you can't say buy this, sell that and all of that, but if you were a, an average investor, I, I think we have a lot of people who would qualify under that term who are listening right now. Uh, what would you be uh, just generally from an educational standpoint, however you need to frame it, but but how should people be thinking about uh, protecting, preserving or even growing their, their financial wealth at this point in time? Well, um, you know, it, it is difficult for everyone, but... I would focus on companies that make things that people want and need, um, you know, which wouldn't be buggy whips, but, um, you know, that actually have assets or have a factory or, you know, something underneath them that have low debt, um, that, you know, are trading at reasonable PE ratios, maybe they're out of favor, but that are actually businesses that produce something. Um, I, I would focus on that. Um, and also, if there comes a future inflationary environment, you might find that the underlying assets actually will appreciate in value because it will cost more money to replace um, equipment and things. So those things will have, you know, intrinsic value. Um, I would just, again, focus on the, princi the fundamental principles of finance 
and not get dazzled by IPOs. I, I kid you not, I had lunch on Saturday with um, a woman that I've known for years who worked in finance, and she told me she's day trading leveraged ETFs. And I thought, gee, nothing could go wrong with that, right? But it's her money to gamble if she chooses to. And by the way, I'm not in the business of regulating consensual adult behavior. If people want to speculate, they're free to do that. But you were asking me, you know, for the long run, um, again, I, I would try not to get distracted by the public narrative that everything is different about finance when it isn't. It's trans finance. Don't be fooled by the cosmetics. <laughs> trans finance. Don't be fooled by the cosmetics. I love it. So, uh, well, with that, I mean, honestly, we could keep talking for hours and hours. I've got much more to talk to you about, uh, but this is the time we have for this podcast today. So, Janet, thank you very much for your time. And I know you've got some events coming up, and, and I want people to be able to follow your excellent work. And of course, uh, oh, I, I would say, Chris, um, for your uh, viewers, they can, if they're members of Amazon Prime, then they can download decisions, Life and Death on Wall Street, for free. They can read it for free if they are members of Amazon Prime. That's what I did. And uh, so, yeah, Decisions, great book. And, and uh, uh, just love how you, you just really put the, um, you put the story in what's actually happening there. And, and I think people really should read uh, up on the history and, and how we got here because we didn't just we didn't just like as George Carlin said we didn't just pass through a membrane and, and get here you know in this strange moment in time we got here because of the decisions that were made and boy those are going to ripple and and reflect for a long time so uh, there's that and then of course there's your website yes um, well it's a long one it's probably easier to google my name than the website it's www.tavacoli structuredfinance.com. Um, we'll put also, a link to that. And also, as I mentioned, I uh, will be publishing a couple of articles at the Gatestone Institute, um, which is, in my view, perhaps the only forum that is available on the web that criticizes Islam in a sourced and uh, reasonable way, you know, without any um, over-exaggeration because the truth is horrific enough. And I'm not criticizing Islam, but fundamentalist Islam. Let me be clear there. Great. And, and I notice um, on your website as well, the books you mentioned, by Wall Street Point of View by Henry Clues, uh, another one, 20 Years of Inside Life in Wall Street uh, by Fowler, also just linked through uh, very handily on your website. So those other references you made, people can get yeah. there. They can also get them for free at archive.org, you know, on the web. Um, if they, they want to read it in that format, it's more difficult to read it in that format, but it is possible. Great. Well, so for people who, who uh, for a few bucks would make a difference, that's a great piece of advice there. So, Janet, again, thank you so much for your time today, and I hope to do this again soon. Great. Thank you, Chris.